time to spend with their patients. Surely that is something all of us can agree on. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on an update on the fiscal framework. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement and there should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. I call on Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister, about 10 minutes. Presiding officer, I want to take this opportunity to update Parliament on the progress of the negotiations to agree a fiscal framework to accompany the Scotland Bill. Over recent days, we have continued to work with the UK Government to secure a fair deal. I am determined that this work should continue for as long as necessary to secure agreement, subject, of course, to the views of the Devolution Further Powers Committee and Parliament as a whole. The Deputy First Minister updated the Devolution Committee this morning, and he will update the Finance Committee tomorrow. It has always been our intention to allow Parliament adequate time to consider and scrutinise any agreement. And so, in the continued absence of such an agreement, I think it's right that I explain to Parliament why our discussions have not yet reached a satisfactory conclusion. As members know, for the new powers contained in the Scotland Bill to be delivered, a fair fiscal framework has to be agreed between the Scottish and UK governments. That framework will determine how the powers proposed by the Smith Commission can be used, and so it is as important, if not more so, than the Scotland Bill itself. In setting out the current position on the fiscal framework, I want to remind Parliament of the key principles set out by the Smith Commission. Uh, the Smith Commission said that the Barnett formula should continue to determine the size of the block grant. That is the benchmark against which all the proposals for the block grant adjustment should be assessed. Crucially, Lord Smith set out his interpretation of the principle of no detriment, that Scotland's budget should be no larger or smaller simply as a result of devolution. Uh, that means, in my view, that if tax policy and economic performance in Scotland remain the same as in the rest of the UK, then the Scottish budget should be no better or worse off than it would have been under the Barnett formula had tax powers not been devolved. Equally, the rest of the UK should be no better or worse off either. This is about the appropriate transfer of risk and responsibility. We have always accepted that if the Scottish Government changes tax policy or if our economic performance diverges from the rest of the UK, then the costs and benefits of that should fall to the Scottish Budget. But if nothing changes, if tax policy remains the same and we match UK economic performance, then our overall budget should not change either. This embodies the Smith principle of economic responsibility. <coughs> Treading officer, the Scottish Government has engaged constructively in these negotiations. Since March last year, there have been 10 meetings between the Deputy First Minister and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury through the Joint Exchequer Committee. The Deputy First Minister has also discussed the issue with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I have also discussed it with the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. As a result of all of these discussions, I am pleased to advise Parliament that we have now reached or are close to reaching an agreed position on all of the main issues other than the block grant adjustment mechanism. For example, on the financial transfers required to meet implementation and administration costs, we have reached what I think is a fair resolution. On capital and resource borrowing, we've made good progress on ensuring the Scottish Government will be able to manage tax volatility and economic shocks, while also securing additional flexibility to invest in infrastructure. Uh, getting to this point, of course, has required compromise on both sides. However, I believe that we have secured results that are fair to Scotland and to the UK and which reflect the recommendations of the Smith Commission. The key issue on which we have not yet reached agreement is the block grant adjustment. The Scottish Government has considered a number of proposals put forward by the UK Government, all of which would deliver detriment to the Scottish Budget. The method of adjusting the block grant that the Scottish Government has proposed, per capita indexed deduction, would deliver no detriment as set out by the Smith Commission. Per capita index deduction is predictable, transparent and sustainable. It guarantees the outcome of no detriment, regardless of changes in Scotland's population share. It is considered to be the best way of delivering no detriment by distinguished economists such as Professor Anton Muscatelli and by the STUC. It also has the support of many members across this chamber and of the Finance Committee of this Parliament and the Scottish Affairs Committee of the House of Commons. In proposing per capita index deduction, we've listened to concerns from the UK Government about its implications for the second Smith principle, taxpayer fairness. As a result, we amended our proposal to ensure that Scotland would not benefit from any changes to devolved taxes in the rest of the UK. 
In summary, the proposal we put forward guarantees no detriment to taxpayers, both in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. However, we remain unable to reach an agreement with the UK Government on this issue. Uh, the reason, in my view, for that is not just that we have a difference of opinion on how to reach an agreed outcome. It is more that we have a difference of opinion about the outcome we are seeking to achieve. In short, the UK Government does not share our interpretation of the principle of no detriment. Our interpretation of no detriment is, as I have set out, and I think it shares widespread support across Scotland. The UK Government's view is that in the years following the transfer of powers, the Scottish budget should bear detriment as a result of relatively slower population growth, even though we are gaining no new powers to influence population growth. Now, on a positive note, the UK Government has now sig signalled some movement towards our position. The Treasury has now offered to deliver on a transitional basis a no detriment outcome for the period up to 2021-22. This would be achieved by annual adjustments to a Treasury proposed methodology rather than by our preferred method of per capita index deduction. However, given that it would deliver exactly the same outcome as PCID, we would be prepared to accept this as significant and welcome progress. However, the key remaining question is what happens at the end of that five-year period. In my view, this is actually now the only substantive issue standing in the way of agreement. Both governments are prepared to agree a review after five years, but we do not yet agree on what the purpose of that review should be. The Scottish Government considers that the review should be to reach agreement on a longer-term block grant adjustment method that delivers results consistent with the Smith Commission's recommendations, including the principle of no detriment that I have set out. We have put forward a proposal on this basis, and discussions continue. However, so far it has appeared that as far as the UK Government is concerned, the purpose of the review would be to decide how, not if, but how we move to a position where the Scottish budget starts to bear population-driven detriment. The Treasury has, over the last couple of days, been suggesting that if we cannot reach agreement on how to do this, there would be an automatic default to their preferred comparability model of block grant adjustment without the transitional arrangements that deliver uh, no detriment uh, continuing in place. Presiding officer, I am well aware that this all sounds highly technical, and it is technical, but it also has very real implications for Scotland's budget over the medium and longer term. And I want to spell out today what those implications would be. If we were to agree the Treasury's preferred approach, then over the 10 years from the end of the transitional period in 2022, Scotland's budget would be reduced systematically compared to Barnet by a cumulative total of £2.5 billion. This reduction would happen even if Scotland's tax rates and economic performance matched the UK's 100%. Now, none of us know exactly what the world will look like in future. It's no secret that I hope Scotland will become an independent country in future. But I could not reach agreement in the full and certain knowledge that if current constitutional arrangements remain in place, the deal will deliver an ongoing substantial and systematic cut to Scotland's budget relative to the Barnett formula after just a single parliamentary term. That would not live up to Smith because it would not protect the Barnett formula and therefore I think it would be a clear breach of the vow. The Treasury's approach would instead see the UK Government extract a significant price in return for the powers that Scotland was promised. Uh, the only concession they would be making is that they will give us five years before they start collecting the payments. <coughs> Presiding officer, the powers Scotland was promised did not have a price tag attached to them when the vow was made. The vow was made freely and unconditionally. The question remains, will it now be delivered? I continue to hope that it will be. I want these new powers. Whether or not we get a deal, I have made clear that I will publish a manifesto that sets out what we would do with these new powers. My government will continue to work to secure agreement for as long as this parliament allows us to do so. Indeed, even as we speak, discussions are ongoing with the Treasury in an attempt to secure movement and find agreement. Uh, however, given that the vow was signed by the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister established the Smith Commission, I am today writing to David Cameron to suggest that if agreement cannot be reached with the Treasury, then he and I should seek to resolve the matter directly between us. Presiding officer, let me be clear. I am prepared to sign up to a deal that includes a transitional arrangement followed by a fair review if, firstly, the review is governed by a shared and continuing commitment to the principles of Smith, including the principle of no detriment that I have set out. 
And secondly, that there is no assumption of a longer term adoption of a model that delivers population driven detriment or any suggestion of an automatic default to such a model in the event that no agreement is reached. Uh, but I will not sign up to a systematic cut to Scotland's budget, whether that cut is being applied now or by a prejudged review in five years' time. Uh, I can advise the Chamber that uh, within the last hour we have received further proposals from the Treasury, uh, which we will now take time to consider, uh, and it will be the test that I have set out that we will judge these proposals against and take a reasonable view of them. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to have updated Parliament today. I think it was appropriate that I did so. Uh, I hope that the Scottish Government will have the full support of Parliament in seeking to secure, even at this 11th hour, a deal that is fair to Scotland and that lives up to the promise that was made to the Scottish people. I will now take questions. On the issues raised in the First Minister's statement, uh, no, the First Minister will take the questions on the issues raised in her statement, not me. I intend to allow 20 minutes for questions, after which we move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the First Minister would press the request speak button now. And I call Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank the First Minister for an advanced copy of her speech. We in the Scottish Labour Party support the First Minister fully as she works to secure a good and fair deal for Scotland in these negotiations. That means securing the new powers on top of those already transferred and protecting the Barnett formula. The message should go out from everyone in this chamber today that we stand behind Barnet and for Scotland. There is a month until this parliament dissolves and the business of government gives way to campaigning. While it is disappointing that we do not have a deal on the fiscal framework, the First Minister makes clear that she wants that deal, a fair deal, in line with the principles of Smith, a position that we absolutely support. So will she assure this Parliament that she and her deputy, John Swinney, will stay at the table however long it takes to secure these powers for Scotland, powers that the majority of people in Scotland want for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Alec Rowley for his questions? Can I first of all thank him for the support he has expressed today for the Scottish Government's uh, position? Um, I made it clear in my statement, and I make it clear that I want a deal, and I am prepared to stay at the table, and the Deputy First Minister is prepared to stay at the table for as long as it takes to get a deal. Of course, it is up to this Parliament to decide how long it would require to scrutinise such a deal before giving legislative consent to the Scotland Bill uh, prior to dissolution, and that is a decision not for me as First Minister, that is a decision for the devolution, for the Powers Committee and, of course, ultimately for the Parliament as a whole. Um, and it should be said, and this is an obvious point I'm about to make, that every day that passes now without a deal is a day less that the Scottish Parliament will have to apply that scrutiny. Um, and that is, is the position that I think everybody will understand. Uh, I hope we can get a deal, as I said in uh, my statement, and apologies this wasn't in the advanced copy of the statement, but the uh, proposal came in after I circulated that. We've now received some additional proposals from the Treasury. We will consider them. I very much hope they will move us closer to that deal. Um, but as I've said, while I want a deal, I am not prepared to sign up to a deal that is unfair to Scotland and doesn't deliver on the promises made. If I was to sign up to what has been on the table from the Treasury in recent days, uh, then frankly, uh, the Scottish uh, people uh, should be seriously displeased uh, at that. I, I will not, as First Minister, sign up to a deal that systematically cuts Scotland's budget. Ruth Davidson. I thank the First Minister for early sight of her statement. I am encouraged to hear that on capital borrowing, financial transfers, an agreement has been concluded. And it is good to hear the First Minister's confirmation in her statement that both sides are close to an agreement on the fiscal framework and an acknowledgement of the movement of the Treasury throughout this process. Um, as I said last week, I wanted both sides to go the extra mile in order to reach an agreement, and it seems that we have substantially less distance to travel now. I am sure that the First Minister's Proposals uh, in her statement on the question of a review will be considered, and I trust and believe that they will be examined without prejudice by the UK Government. 
Um, following the update from the Treasury in the last hour, I understand that the Chancellor is hoping to speak to the First Minister directly as soon as possible, and I'm pleased that that is taking place. So can I ask, with uh, an agreement so close within touching distance, will the First Minister still work to find a compromise with the UK Government on the question of how a review is conducted over the coming hours? First Minister. I have always uh, been willing to compromise. The Deputy First Minister has compromised in getting us to the position uh, we are in now. When, uh, if we get a deal, as I hope we do, and when Parliament begins to scrutinise this deal, the evidence of that compromise on a whole range of issues uh, will be clear. But what I've also said, and uh, I've said this consistently, is I will not compromise on the principle of no detriment. Uh, because once you compromise on that principle, we compromise on the delivery of the promise that was made to the Scottish people. Um, and that is what I will not compromise on. Uh, the compromise uh, and the willingness of the Scottish Government to compromise uh, has already been clear from uh, the fact that I have signalled that we would accept a transitional arrangement, which is not going to be based on our preferred model, but because it delivers the same outcome as our preferred model, we will compromise on that, but the outcome and the principle uh, underpinning the outcome of no detriment to the Scottish budget is the key one, and that's the principle. I don't think the Scottish people uh, should be prepared to allow me or the Deputy First Minister to compromise on. Chris Crawford, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, four out of five parties in Smith, the STUC, and almost all respected independent academic experts have argued for the per capita index deduction method as a means of ensuring that Scotland does not face a huge loss of income right from the start. First Minister, I am glad that you have said today there has been progress and the discussions are ongoing, but agreement is still to be achieved and the clock is ticking towards dissolution. The Prime Minister might have had other things on his mind of late, but does the First Minister agree with me it is high time he got himself fully engaged in the discussions to guarantee his so-called vow is delivered? First Minister. I, I think Bruce Crawford is right to outline the breadth of support there is for the Scottish Government's position. L let me say, though, that what has mattered and will continue to matter to the Scottish Government is the outcome we reach. We've put forward a proposal that we think best delivers that outcome, uh, but it is the outcome rather than the precise route to the outcome that is the most important thing of all. Um, in terms of the, the Prime Minister, I hope we can uh, reach agreement with the Treasury and I hope we can do that sooner rather than later. Uh, I spoke to the Prime Minister by telephone a couple of weeks ago. I think it's entirely understandable that he has been engaged in other matters over the last week or so. Uh, but I'm very clear that if we do not manage to reach agreement on the key issue of principle uh, with the Treasury, then it will be incumbent on the Prime Minister to step in and, with me, uh, seek to reach an agreement that delivers the promise he made. Uh, and I would simply remind the Chamber and uh, the wider public, the promise we are talking about right now, the vow we are talking about, is not my vow, it is the Prime Minister's vow, and I think it's incumbent on him to deliver it. Jackie Bailey, followed by Willie Rennie. Could I welcome the First Minister's statement and support her and the Deputy First Minister in working to secure the best deal for Scotland. And I agree that there can be no compromise on that fundamental principle of no detriment. The First Minister is right to underline the importance of Barnet transfers to the funding of Scottish public services. Could I ask her what analysis does the Scottish Government have of the value of Barnet to Scottish spending? First Minister. Well, while we remain in the current constitutional arrangements, I think it's accepted uh, by all of us that Barnet should continue. That was uh, the basis of the vow that was made. Once we uh, get to a point where we have uh, either a deal or where we don't have a deal in time for the uh, end of this parliamentary session. And then, as the Deputy First Minister has already said, we will publish all of the analysis and all of the correspondence that has uh, underpinned uh, these negotiations. But uh, in a sense, you know, let's not get away from the key issue here. Barnet and the continuation of Barnet and the benchmarking of all these proposals against Barnet was the promise that was made. It was the continuation of the Barnet formula that was emblazoned all over the front page of the Daily Record, and therefore it is right that we judge proposals against it. Will Rennie, followed by Linda Fabiani. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And I thank the First Minister for the advanced sight of her statement. Um, I do want the First Minister to stick to the Scottish position. 
This morning, John Swinney told the committee there was a fundamental difference. A fundamental difference. I'm not sure what has changed within four hours, where there now seems to be a compromise agreement based on the Treasury model she disagrees with so fundamentally. It's the point that John Swinney has been making for a number of weeks now. So if she says, as she says, it makes no difference for five years, then why, if she sticks to the Scottish position, we can enter the uncertainty of the review in five years' time from a strong position rather than based on the Treasury model? Why is she asking us to abandon the fundamental principle of the model that she's been promoting for the last few weeks? Why is that the case? First Minister. I have uh, made clear that what I want to deliver is an outcome of no detriment. Now, what is on the table for a transitional period uh, would deliver that outcome. And that, I, I think, is significant progress and significant movement from the Treasury. Uh, if we are to have a review, then it is absolutely vital that it is a review uh, that is not prejudged uh, or prejudiced in advance, that is not based on an assumption uh, that we then revert in the absence of agreement to a compatibility model that would deliver detriment. So that is uh, the, the continuation of that uh, application of principle. Uh, that's what will continue to uh, guide the Scottish Government. I hope that the Treasury continues to move towards that position and we will make our judgment uh, on whether uh, the deal that is on the table is a deal that delivers that fundamental principle of no detriment. Linda Fabiani, followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you. First Minister, during the Smith process, there were certain principles that were in fact key. I and others in this chamber can confirm that the principle of no detriment was one of these key principles. Can you confirm, First Minister, that the approach taken by the Scottish Government will continue to reflect reasonableness, fairness, and no detriment to Scotland. First Minister. Well, no detriment is the principle that we have insisted on all along, and it is the principle that we will continue uh, to insist on. Uh, no detriment, as I have set out, it's not trying to avoid the responsibility of new powers. Uh, under the no detriment principle that we set out, we would take the responsibility of exercising tax policy and of matching UK economic performance. Uh, that is not insignificant. Uh, but what we will not do is take on the responsibility uh, over population change that we do not have the powers uh, to determine. So uh, the principle of no detriment drives everything we have done and will continue to drive the position that we take. Mark McDonnell, followed by Jenny Mara. I uh, thank the First Minister for her statement. And while it's encouraging to see progress being made, there is obviously concern that the Treasury seems to view the fiscal framework as a means by which to cut the budget of Scotland in the longer term. Does the First Minister believe that the approach being taken by the Treasury thus far matches the so-called respect agenda that the Prime Minister has so often spoken of? First Minister. Well, as I said in my statement, a, a promise was made. It was made freely. It was made unconditionally. It didn't have a two or a three or however many billion pounds price tag attached to it. But the approach that has been taken thus far uh, would see in return for the devolution of these powers, the Scottish budget being cut uh, by a significant amount uh, over a period of time. Now, I don't think that is either showing respect uh, or delivering the promise that was made. Now, we have seen some movement uh, of this, that, so that we are now in a position where that principle of no detriment is being agreed for a transitional period. Uh, but we have to make sure that any review after that transitional period is also based on that important principle of no detriment. Jenny Mara, followed by Alex Salmond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Clearly, this Parliament wants to see a deal as soon as possible. Bruce Crawford referred to dissolution fast approaching in his question to the First Minister. Is the First Minister prepared to negotiate on behalf of the Scottish people beyond dissolution if this takes a bit longer? First Minister. Well, look, let's concentrate in trying to negotiate to a successful conclusion in advance of dissolution. Now, if we can't do that, then you know, certainly it will be for the Scottish people to express their view in a democratic election. Uh, but I'm negotiating now in good faith um, and negotiating in good faith to try to seek an agreement that will allow the powers that were promised. It's no secret. I don't think the powers that are on the table uh, go as far as they should. I don't think they go as far as the, the promise, but they are what 
are on the table right now, and it is absolutely essential that the UK Government lives up to the promise to deliver them. So I will focus on trying to uh, secure that agreement before dissolution uh, so that we can get into the position that this Parliament was told it would be in. Alex Salmon, followed by Rob Gibson. Can I uh, join the Scottish Labour Party in giving full support to the First Minister's uh, position? There are no sides in this, only Scotland's side. The Prime Minister recently secured a pre-referendum commitment from 27 other heads of state around Europe as to what would happen after a European referendum. Hadn't he better hope that they keep their pledge to him rather better than he thus far has kept his vow to Scotland? First Minister. I think that is an important point. The Prime Minister is going to be campaigning over these next few months in a referendum where he is going to ask people uh, to put faith in the commitments that he has made, commitments that were uh, gained by him through the recent negotiations. Um, I don't think it would be helpful to what he wants to achieve in the forthcoming referendum, which is the same thing I want to see achieved in the forthcoming referendum, albeit that we come at it from different perspectives. If people are going to see in this context that his word given freely during a referendum campaign cannot be trusted. Rob Gibson, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister stressed the principles of no detriment, and will these apply to the multi-million pound costs of setting up uh, the administration of Scottish welfare powers, which could take several years to work? Because the Deputy First Minister told the Devolution Committee this morning that the Treasury's best offer on set-up costs for welfare is a figure below the DWP's own estimate for the costs of setting up welfare. Can the First Minister confirm that this is an example of an area where the Scottish Government has been more than reasonable in these uh, negotiations? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I think that will uh, be borne out uh, as we get into the scrutiny, hopefully, of a deal or indeed the scrutiny of uh, why there isn't a deal. Uh, the Smith Commission, of course, said that we should be paid a fair share of uh, the costs of setting up uh, the, the setup of new responsibilities. Uh, we have compromised here, as we have compromised in a whole range of areas in order to get to a deal that we think is fair uh, and reasonable. Um, and that fairness and reasonableness uh, approach is the one we will continue to take. But what we cannot compromise on are core principles. No detriment is a core principle, and that's why uh, we have put it so central to the entire discussion. Alison Johnson, followed by Stuart Maxwell. Um, thank you. Will Parliament be properly able to scrutinise this proposed transitional arrangement in the last few weeks of this session? And following the suggested transitional period, who will be involved in any review? And will this Parliament and wider Scotland be more involved than it has been to date? First Minister. Well, I, I want Parliament to have the ability to fully scrutinise all uh, aspects of any deal that is forthcoming. That is why, notwithstanding uh, what I've said about being prepared to stay at the table for as long as it takes, I am also very mindful of the fact that every day that we remain at the table is a day less for Parliament to perform that essential scrutiny role. In terms of Alison Johnson's question about who will undertake the review, all of these things are, are matters that remain under discussion in terms of uh, seeking to ensure that we can get to a principle uh, and an outcome that satisfies the test that I have set out. But I want this Parliament, and I am absolutely sure this Parliament wants this Parliament, to have adequate time to properly scrutinise the outcome of this negotiation ahead of a vote on a legislative consent motion. Stuart Maxwell, followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, Presiding officer, the First Minister has previously said that the Scottish Government would put proposals on the table based on per capita index reduction but tweaked to ensure that if the rest of the UK increased tax rates and spend it on rest of the UK services, none of that money would come to Scotland. Can the First Minister confirm that this delivers on the second no detriment principle, sometimes referred to as the taxpayer fairness principle? First Minister. Yes, I mean, the, the proposal we put forward originally um, of uh, per capita index deduction, uh, the UK government said that that, in their view, wouldn't meet the second uh, Smith principle of taxpayer fairness. We therefore uh, modified that proposal to take account of that. So the proposal that we uh, had put forward uh, satisfies both the principle of no detriment and the principle of taxpayer fairness. And let me repeat, it's those principles uh, that we are seeking to satisfy and it's those principles that we'll continue to seek to achieve in the remainder of the negotiations. Stuart McMillan. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Professor Anton Muscatelli and others have put estimates uh, in the public domain of how much the different methods of indexation would cut Scotland's budget by ranging from £7 billion pounds to around £2.5 billion. Pounds. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber if the UK Government has at any point put an option on the table that actually delivers Smith's proposals of no detriment, or have they only ever put options on the table that would see Scotland's budget being cut? First Minister. Well, until recently, all of the proposals put forward by the UK Government would have delivered detriment. And to be fair to the UK Government, I don't think they're trying to hide that to any great extent. I think they are being fairly explicit that they think Scotland's budget should uh, suffer detriment. I'm sure they wouldn't articulate it in this way, but suffer detriment because of relatively slower, slower population growth. That has changed in the last few days, where, as I said in my statement, we now have a proposal on the table that would guarantee no detriment for a transitional period uh, with the potential of a review. But it is uh, whether we can get an agreement or of a review that would continue to ensure that no detriment would be the guiding or a guiding principle uh, is one of the issues that we continue to see if we can resolve. Thank you. That ends the statement from the First Minister on the uh, fiscal uh, statement. Um, the next item of business is a debate on motion number 15645. In the name of Christine Graham and Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights, I'll give a few moments for the Chamber to settle.